I think if you go out looking specifically for a mentor, it's kind of a big heavy ask Absolutely, right off the bat. Yeah. So plus all the perceptions that you have about that person being the perfect mentor for you, probably are going to be wrong because you've colored a lot of stuff in around the edges that probably shouldn't be there. We all do this. We put people up on pedestals before we kind of know them really, and it can be the wrong person. But just having the intention or the want or the desire of having mentors in your life typically creates the vacuum for those people to show up. Um, and you never know where they come from. That's been my experience for sure. I have consistently seen it where the people who operate at the highest levels are like, it's just a constant mission of who's my, like, where my next, where's my next mentor going to come from? It's this insatiable appetite for just wanting to be around the best. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Community Made Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaynor. Now, as you know, this season is all about how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships. In the first few episodes of this season, I shared three unique stories which served as examples of how to reach the unreachable and befriend celebrities and billionaires. I shared my playbook on how to foster deep and genuine relationships with people at conferences and networking events, even if you're an introvert, that's right, no more excuses. And I also shared why the wisest investment is wisdom and how to make the most out of a mentor-mentee relationship. In today's episode, I sit down with Mr. Mentorship himself, Todd Herman. Now, Todd is a really good friend of mine who has been pivotal in my life on several occasions. At the core of everything he does, I guess one could say he helps ambitious people perform, whether that be Olympic athletes to billionaire entrepreneurs. He's one of the most sought after peak performance coaches in the space. And thankfully, a few years ago, Todd decided to offer his wisdom, I guess you could say, to a larger audience by packaging a lot of his teachings into his 90-day year system. This is one of the few online products that I've purchased, and it's fantastic. So for more details on Todd and specifically that program, uh, visit the 90-day year website, 90dayyear.com. That's 90dayyear.com. Now, in this episode, Todd lays out his framework to find a great mentor. He shares his personal playbook on how to be a great mentor and talks about the benefits that you'll get through mentoring other people. A few housekeeping things to note before we get into this great conversation. First, Todd wrote a fantastic mini book called How to Find and Become a Mentor, which served as a foundation for the structure of my last episode, The Wisest Investment is Wisdom. It's a fantastic read. I highly recommend you check it out. To get access to Todd's free guide, simply visit Todd Herman, T-O-D-D-H-E-R-M-A-N dot me slash blog or just go to toddherman.me and look at the blog you'll see an opportunity there to leave your email address to download this pdf i promise you it's good i opted in probably two years ago and i saved it right to evernote and i'm glad i did because if he were to ever take this off <laughs> it would be a shame it would be an absolute shame so go to toddherman.me slash blog second in the last episode i i shared a I guess a high level overview of a mentoring session worksheet that has worked really well for me over the years. So to get access to that actual PDF worksheet, which also works great for masterminds as well, if you're a part of one, visit the resource section of the Community Made group. If you're not a member, lucky for you, joining is free. Simply visit communitymade.com to get access. And the third and final thing, I decided to take some of the concepts shared in this season on how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships and go deeper in a live, intimate workshop setting. To my surprise, we announced the first one before season two came out. It sold out within a day and a half, so we decided to announce a second one. So for dates and availability on that workshop, visit superconnectorworkshop.com. That's superconnectorworkshop.com workshop.com. That's it. I won't keep you from it any longer. Enjoy this great conversation with the great Todd Herman. For context, I've known you for years. Yeah. Um, and I'll talk about you more in a second uh, in the sense that you've been incredibly impactful uh, in my life. But um, when preparing for this on the, on the flight here specifically, I was really doing a lot of deep digging researching um, 
I knew season two, I wanted to do an episode on mentorship. And I have a lot of people who kind of, uh, who have had great mentors and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you were the first person that like you own real estate in my head when it mm-hmm. comes to the word mentorship. And I remember you releasing a PDF yeah. uh, a while ago on how to find a mentor ultimately, or just like what that mentor relationship looks like. Cause I'm like, there's no great books or resources on this. I'm like, yeah. and to me, like I feel compelled, like even like uh, business relationships. Like I don't think there's any great books out there that I can point people to. And if there was, then I wouldn't have to write a book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Same thing with mentorship. I'm like, there's, mentorship is so valuable, but there's nothing good out there. Yeah. So I'm like, Shh, that's going to be my next thing. I have to write a bloody book on mentorship. 100%. Um, but I looked through my Evernote because I'm like, I remember saving a PDF you did. Um, and honestly, I should have expected, you know, uh, I should have expected, I guess, more from you on some level in the sense that uh, so many people release these PDFs as like lead magnets and yeah. like garbage. Yeah. Um, but I printed out that PDF and I read that PDF and there's not a single thing I would add. It was so like clear and concise. It did a significantly better job than, than I could have done. Um, and dude, I, I can't tell you I'm impressed. I am by that stupid PDF. It was really, really well done. Dude, I got to sell that thing better than it. Cause I, 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 it's, it's out there as my, you know, on the landing or on, on, not even on the landing page. I don't even have landing pages for it. It's just, you know, go to my, when you go to my website, cause I talk about mentorship and yeah, you know, you can opt in and get it, but I really don't even advertise it really many other places. But because yeah. I've never seen you like, I, I, it's never made rounds in my yeah. Like I caught it at one point in time, and that's why I saved it because yeah. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll check it out one day um, and print it out. And then I haven't heard about it for the last two years, yeah. two and a half years. And then I finally read it, and I was like, this is gold. Like yeah. no two. Like, I was, I, dude, you should have saw my face while I was reading it. Like <laughs> absolute gold. And that's again, awesome. I shouldn't have expected anything less from you because. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I again, I'm a huge, huge Todd Herman fan. We originally connected kind of years ago, um, and, and actually on a trip that I did to New York. Probably was my first trip ever to New York, and we were both in a in a group or an organization. Yeah. And I, I, I think I reached out to you, kind of cold, or you knew I was coming, and you said let's let's meet up. And at the time, I was struggling. I mean, at that time, mm-hmm. that's when I was. In my darkest moments of being, you know, quarter million dollars in debt, didn't know what business I was going to do next. I was stuck in transition. I was getting married to my wife like the following month. I, my daughter was turning six months old and that was the biggest pain point of my life at the time was unfortunately my, my relationship with my daughter. Um, you know, one of the things I realized was one of the reasons I chose to be an entrepreneur is is to have as much control of my life as possible. I've come to realize I'm a control freak. Um, so be able to control my time, what I do with it, have the, the, the freedom of relationships and purpose and meaning and finances and all that kind of stuff. And I'll never forget it. I mean, there's a few times you've, you've shared something with me that fundamentally shifted everything. And at, uh, when we first met first interaction, I remember first thing you came in, uh, we met at the Reebok gym, yeah. uh, downtown and, uh, you had a copy of seeking wisdom, mm-hmm. which has since become, I mean, one of the few books that I reread once a year. I don't yeah. read a lot of books, but that is a phenomenal book. And I know it's a book that you yeah. hold dear as well. And, uh, yeah, when I, I kind of felt compelled to open up to you and, and kind of share that my, my struggles with my daughter. And, um, I remember you saying, uh, you know, one way you can look at it is that she's a, a beautiful constraint yeah. and that she forces you to focus on things that truly matter. And that shifted everything because things were going in the wrong direction yeah. until I heard those words. So yeah. um, that's not the first time nor the last time uh, <laughs> that you've had a huge kind of impact on my life. You've been a, a dear friend since. And, you know, one of the things I, I value most about you is that there's you are loved by many, and some people may not love you as much. But there's no there's no gray area with no. you. Like you are black and white. You are uh, blunt when need be, but you you care deeply. I mean, there's. I remember when I did a workshop last year on how did we do mastermind talks. Yeah. Uh, I put it out to the public, and it sold out like in the first day. And while it was kind of selling out, I mean, I had friends kind of signing up left, right, and center. And then uh, you were the one of the few people who messaged me, and you're like, "Dude, this is this is great." But you're underselling yourself. Yeah. And um, just another moment when it's just getting reconfirmed what an amazing, uh, yeah, amazing friend you are. So, I mean, 100%. I, I got to say, feel the, uh, way, feel the same way. Feel the same way. Well, what's, thank what's, you. What's, what's, what's crazy about the whole, as you were going through that kind of, you know, whatever life crisis or just challenge that you're going through and quarter million dollars in debt, is there was no narrative 
outside of you that would have led anyone of us to believe that that was even going on. Mm. Um, and the character and integrity with the way that you always carry yourself precedes you and, you know, creates a narrative in our heads. So, you know, that's why you've got so many people who are always going to have your back for you. So even though that's, that's the best part is even though so like if you operate at a f- super low level with the way that you treat other people, and then you go into those dark times because everyone's got to, then it, it makes it a hell of a lot harder to crawl out of those times mm-hmm. because you don't really have much social capital sure. working for you. Sure, sure. But at least, you know, hopefully you and I know that, you know, if you do hit those terrible times, yeah. you got a great group of people around you who can, you know, help support and bring you out pretty quickly. Though. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, you and I definitely have a strong alignment of, of values and our priorities are very similar. I yeah. mean, we both, we both value obviously integrity yeah. immensely and, and relationships. Um, I was going to talk about it later in the, in the episode, yeah, but I mean, one of the things um, that you do that I, I need to do a better job of, I do it in my own little way, but it's like handwritten notes. Mm-hmm. You've been doing handwritten notes for God knows how long. Since I was just about 22. So and you do in the the rule, or I guess I don't want to say rule, like yeah. there's, but but basically you do almost one a day. I do one a day. One That's a how day. I start the day. That's my first activity on my calendar. It's not even has to be. It's not even on my calendar anymore yeah. because it's just the routine of how sure, I work. It's a ritual, but yeah. you know, is my and we'll talk about mentorships. But one of my mentors challenged me to just write a handwritten note a month. And so me being competitive, I was like, <laughs> handwritten <laughs> note. That sounds like one a month. How can that even make an impact? Yeah. I bet you I could do like one a week. Yeah. And then I just, it, it's, it's that magic of getting a feedback loop closed quickly. So wrote, the, wrote a few notes or letters out to people. And again, they're like simple, like on a one page sheet. Mm-hmm. Now they're just simple, they're just on a one page sheet. Um, and like every single person I wrote to, like got back to me right away. And so now that I've done, I've done over 4,300 letter notes and letters. Um, and I've only not been contacted, contacted back about 8% of the time. Mm. But like Philip Seymour Hoffman got back to me, you know, the now deceased actor, Daniel Day-Lewis wrote back, uh, Ronald Reagan, Nancy Reagan, like, you know, and those, cause those actually Ronald Reagan was one of the first letters that I wrote no and responded back on presidential letterhead in, in the late nineties. But, um, he, they almost to the letter, every single person will write back with, you have no idea how much I needed to get that note today. Mm. It's just life's hard, man. Yeah. And, it's, and sometimes you don't get that feedback loop closed on, you know, how much you've maybe made an impact on someone else. And just a few short words, because I don't want to go into a big, long diatribe with people, but just a few short words is all it takes. Um, I think one of the key things that I do with the letter, though, is like if I, you know, reading Mastermind, Mastermind Dinner's book, um, it, there's no sweeter sound to the ears of someone else than the sound of their own name mm-hmm. or their own words repeated back to them. Mm. Nothing sounds sweeter to someone's ears than those two things. And so I, I make it a purpose that I'll always put in some sort of substance of the letter that I love what you wrote on page 72 mm. when you said, and then I'll block quote it. And it's so like that completely shifted. Just like you said, like, I mean, I love hearing that, you know, when I said the beautiful constraint means something to you. Like that, of course, I like that. Um, and so why wouldn't it make, mean something to you if I said the same thing back to you but like the words like that shifted the way that I think about investing in a dinner like mm. it was always a cost to me before yeah now it's not even close to being thought of that way yeah. so you know just one little trick that anyone can add into um some sort of you know that I, I ever tell you the the funny story of because of, I I totally agree and I do it in my own kind of little way but I do want to create much I don't it's not a daily practice yeah um and I think it would be incredibly profound if it was mm-hmm. a daily practice um but did I ever tell you the story about uh, Adam Grant and Jonah Berger no <laughs> no I I a uh, couple couple of years ago um again it, you know an author will spend years of their life they'll put their heart and soul into a book yeah put it out to the world. I don't care who you are. You're terrified of like what people think of it and, and just you're hypersensitive um, when it comes to your work like that. And uh, I mean, they get somewhat of a closed feedback loop because of Amazon reviews, but not really. They're anonymous and, and those kind of things. So what I decided to do was I recorded a video. So two books that were really impactful for me, one was Contagious by Jonah Berger and the other one was um, Give and Take by Adam Grant. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I recorded uh, a video for each of them 
And uh, I said very specifically, it wasn't just like, oh, I love your book. It was yeah. like, these are the things that I took away from the book. These are the things that, you, that I applied. This is how it's going to change my life, or this is how it has changed my life or business, or whatever yeah. the case may be. And I clicked, I sent the emails, and I was driving my car. I know exactly where I was on the highway. I mean, I remember vividly. <laughs> I got an email from Adam Grant saying, hey, this is, thank you so much for the video, all that kind of stuff. He's like, but uh, this video was for, for Jonah Berger. So I, <laughs> and they're really close friends. So he forwarded the, the, the thing to Jonah. And Jonah ended up, he's like, oh, I got a video too, but it's your video. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that. My heart sank. I pulled off on the side of the road, and I'm like, what the hell did you I do? You know what I'm usually Because I, I take, if, if I've got one skill, it's, you know, it comes from my, my football days of being in a football locker room where you've got some pretty good fast talking, you know, cutting people is being able to like think really quickly on my feet. So what I would do is, you know what guys, that was actually on purpose. I was trying to make your ideas contagious and see how they just spread. <laughs> <laughs> so mentorship. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your, like, did you always understand the value of mentorship or did there was there a specific incident that like you, because I'm trying to remember even myself, like, I, I would not be where I am without mentors. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to like with, with you, I'm trying to see yeah. like, is that something you just innately knew? Like you had a, a you know, a family figure that was almost like a, served yeah. as a mentor and you kept that theme throughout your life or was there a specific moment where somebody took you under their wing. Yeah, I, th I think the I think there was a. It's like it's like most things. Sometimes you learn your behavior from you know those people that are closest to and around you. And mm -hmm. so, my parents, it's not, they were they weren't big on mentorship. I mean, we were a very simple farm family in you know, the southeastern part of Alberta, Canada. Um, but, you know, Dad said to me once, you know, if you want to be great at anything, find whoever's the best at it, and mm -hmm. you know, learn from them. He and he said that I think expressly to me and not to my other brothers and sisters, because. I, he knew I was going to be the one who was not going to be taking over the family farm and was going to be, you know, the black, not the black sheep, but, you know, the one sure. who goes off and kind of, you know, puts the hobo um, uh, stick with the bag over his shoulder and sort of ventures off. And He was right. You're in Chelsea now. Yeah, I'm in Chelsea. <laughs> totally. I live in West Chelsea in New York City. Um, so, but I think early on I sort of learned, the, I was, I, I learned the value of having someone around you who was just amazing. Mm -hmm. So Grant Henderson was my first real mentor and he was my teacher at Schuler school. And, um, just this person that I looked up to cause he was just this great athletic specimen and loved football, like, like myself. And, um, just, he kind of got me. I was one of those kids that kind of really never felt like most people got me. My mm -hmm. Nana got me cause mm -hmm. I was very much like my papa, like mm -hmm. my grandfather. And so I think when you feel like you're like misunderstood, you're always trying to find, well, is there anyone out there who's like me or kind of gets, gets me? Mm -hmm. And then now that I know, now that I do what I do and I've done it for a long time, it's a very common feeling for many people. Like that you're, some people can feel like they're alone in the world. Um, and so when you find someone, you sort of latch onto them and that's kind of what I did, but I wasn't a coachable kid. I was a terribly uncoachable kid super opinionated, which is probably shocking to you. Um, <laughs> and, but wasn't very coachable, but Grant really helped with that. And then it was a moment where I understood the value of mentorship when I was started, just started getting into business. And I came in contact with someone who was at the absolute zenith of his career. Um, didn't know who he was, but managed to sit next to Jim Rohn, who is, you know, arguably one of the most popular business philosophers of the last hundred years. Sure. Forbes named him that. And Forbes, I think, in 1999 named him one of the most important business philosophers of the 20th century. And um, I had known him by then for a couple of years, but I sat next to him and he got up and I, my uncle had won an award in Canada for Construction Person of the Year. I went to Banff, Alberta with him to uh, sit at the head table and, you know, watch him get his award and the person sitting next to me was Jim didn't know who he was but he uh was just asking me all these questions super interested in Todd and I couldn't get a word in edgewise and then he got introduced and he went up and you know I was like oh what are you here for are you getting an award he's like no I'm the keynote speaker and I'm like oh my goodness I just got done telling him that I wanted to speak for a living <laughs> and I'm like oh, I'm so out of the loop I'm an idiot and uh he went up got introduced and went up and gave like 53 minutes of the greatest thing my ears had ever heard he's just an absolute poetic business philosopher, you know, since passed away, but he, um, 
he did one of the most important things I think a mentor needs to do when he sat back down, because I would love to have gotten this guy's time. Mm -hmm. And he knew that I was just starting out in business and he gave me three very specific things to go and do. So he gave me some actions, but they were simple actions. Like they weren't overwhelming. It wasn't like, oh, scale Mount Everest. And it, it was almost a test. And um, by the time I got back to my hometown at the time, in Edmonton, I went and did those three things by 1.15 on Monday and called them and said, hey, Jim, it's Todd Herman. I don't know if you remember me, but I'm the guy who stood next to you or sat next to you for six hours at this banquet. <laughs> of course, he's going to remember because it was only two days earlier. And uh, I'm done those things. Now what do I do? Mm -hmm. And then he called me back the next day because he was still traveling. And, you know, we talked for a bit and gave me another thing to do. It didn't start as a, like a mentorship in the beginning. Yeah. Just a conversation. I think if you go out looking specifically for a mentor, it's kind of a big heavy ask Absolutely, right off the bat. Yeah. So plus all the perceptions that you have about the, that person being the perfect mentor for you, probably are going to be wrong because you've colored a lot of stuff in around the edges that probably shouldn't be there. We all do this. We put people up on pedestals yeah. before we kind of know them really. And it can be the wrong person. But just having the intention or the want or the desire of having mentors in your life typically creates the vacuum for those people to show up. Um, and you never know where they come from. It's, that's been my experience mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, there's so much here to unpack. Um, and if you hear me shuffling papers in the background, that's me <laughs> going through your printed out PDF version because it, it does a beautiful job just leaning into the conversation yeah. and just talking about the myths, which we'll talk about yeah. in a second and what uh, the relationship looks like on the mentor side and the benefits that yeah. they get and on the, on the mentee side. But... Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the brilliant things that that because a lot of people, I mean, Kevin Spacey said like it's almost like your responsibility that when you reach a certain level of success to send the elevator back down. Yeah. Um. The only again, the only reason I'm where I am is because of mentors. My first mentor, uh, relationship, and it's it's very again sometimes when the people hear the word mentor, it's, it's very kind of heavy, mm -hmm. and it's also people have this 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 idea that you meet up with this person once a month yes. and it's like it, you have this yeah. accountability and all this kind of stuff when it's not the case no. at all. No. Um, but I remember I was 18 at the time and I don't know if you remember Profit Magazine, um, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. they, so they had a publication in Canada called Profit Magazine, which was very similar to Inc. Magazine and like Inc. 500 yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And uh, there was a, so a guy that you know, James Purley, do you, yeah, do you know I know James? Yeah, I know he was my first mentor. Really? Yeah. So the story on Such how that happened, guy. he was he was featured in Profit Magazine on a little like half page spread um, and uh, about like his services, like he would, his company would help uh, tech companies specifically get government grants and that kind of stuff. And um, I'm like, I'm 18 at the time. There has to be some kind of loan or grant I can get from the yeah. government. So I reached out to him and he's like, uh, nicely like saying like, don't bug me. Basically, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. like, I can't help you. Um, you know, that's it. I should actually find that email. Um, and the following month, I was featured in the same magazine, but on a three-page spread uh, about what? like me and like what the the company I was working on and like you know what my plans were for the next eighteen months and all that kind of stuff. And that's when I had a personal concierge business. That was my first, I guess, official yeah. business. And James actually ended up reaching back out to me, and he's like, you know what? Let's do dinner. Let's go for sushi. <laughs> I think it was the first time I ever had sushi, uh, and I was with him, and uh, we met up. And I was probably doing like five or six thousand dollars a month yeah. at the time. And uh, he's like, "Imagine a day when you're doing eighty thousand dollars a month." Mm -hmm. And intellectually, I'm like, "Yeah, sure." Emotionally, I'm like, "There's no way. That's not me. I'll never be able to build a business but that big." About three or four years later, we did our first nine hundred thousand dollar month, mm -hmm. and that's when it struck me. I'm like, "Dude, I remember a day when I couldn't even remotely fathom." attaining yeah. 80,000 yeah. dollars a month we're doing more than 10 times that figure um, and it just made me realize the I mean I've again I've seen the benefits of mentors throughout the years but that's when it hit me like yeah. my god the impact that somebody can have on yeah. you to think bigger yeah. uh, and those kind of things uh, is is super you, profound you hit on something that I actually don't think about that much when it comes to mentorship but that whole shared brain philosophy like when you get into a room with someone it creates a third brain mm -hmm. and for you as someone who's trying to climb the mountain and ladder and being able to just tap into that third brain because they're they're pouring their ideas into that ether and you're pouring yours in and yeah. you know you get to mingle with like stuff that's bigger ideas than your own yeah it's just through osmosis it's really hard not to unless you just want to fight it yourself um uh not grow because of it 
Well, I, I'm, I may change Mastermind Talks and rebrand it as Third Brain. <laughs> so I'm going to see if that domain's available. But actually, that brings me one of the, like, again, I've, I've thought about mentorship a lot. I've been a mentor. I've been a mentee. Like, I know what that relationship looks like. I know, like, the do's and don'ts and all that kind of stuff. One of the things I got from your PDF um, <clears throat> is the, I think it was about retention. Mm-hmm. Um, how, because the, the one thing I always say to people is they're like, oh, you know, I, I want Tim Ferriss to mar- mentor me or mm-hmm. Gary Vaynerchuk and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And I'm like, listen, you have access to all their content as it is. Like, we live in a beautiful time mm-hmm. where you, to what you said, success leaves clues. So follow kind of the, the breadcrumbs. So, yeah. If you want Seth Godin to be your mentor, read all of his books, read all of his blogs, yeah. and, and just go kind of deep. Um, and that's always been my philosophy. And there's obviously there's huge value in that. Um, but the one thing I didn't take into consideration is how we learn and our retention. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I, if we read something, I think retention on your you have this beautiful, uh, I guess, triangle of sorts, and you're like retention for reading is like five percent or ten yeah. percent, uh, as opposed to if it's like this third brain scenario and interaction, it goes up significantly. Yeah. And I can look back on my life. I have not been deeply, there's only really, there's a handful of books. I've read thousands of pages of books, yeah. which doesn't, I don't read a lot of books, but um, there's very few books that have actually like fundamentally shifted my life mm-hmm. as opposed to conversations. Yes. The amount of conversations that yeah. have shifted my life are, it's like, it's a ten, tenfold. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the biggest takeaways I actually got from that. That like again, I tell people to just buy books, read their stuff. Like yeah. that's a good way to get access to people you wouldn't have access to otherwise, and really yeah. dig deep. But then take into account the whole retention side of things and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I actually think about it like cutting the fuse. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is, <clears throat> I think reading or some sort of passive learning exercise is like whatever that goal is, imagine it's like the sticks of dynamite. So your goal is the sticks of dynamite that we're just, we can't wait for us to explode through that thing and, and, and achieve it. And so the more passive stuff that you do takes the fuse and just lengthens, lengthens it out over longer periods of time. Mm-hmm. And so that's why for me, being around people takes the fuse, cuts it basically right next to the dynamite and that's where I light it and all of a sudden you get all these explosions that just keep on happening back to back to back to back mm-hmm. to back because you're out there and they're cutting the context so fast. Like mm-hmm. if it takes me two weeks to read a book, well, if I actually met the author yeah. and talked to the author yeah. in 15 minutes, they're probably going to unpack the best of the best in that conversation in 15 minutes. Sure. So I've cut the fuse. I've just, I've gotten to the explosive contextual, mm-hmm. you know, mind shift that's going to happen much more quickly. So, yeah. and I'm, this is, I'm, I, someone, I love the act of reading, yeah. but I love the act of asking people questions and talking sure. to people way more um, than well, that. And so I remember, it's funny bringing that up because I remember um, <clears throat> a friend of mine, Alex Icon, has a brand called Luxie yeah. Hair and all this kind yeah. of stuff. And he was uh, at one point in time focusing on like analytics. And he's like, he asked me, he uh, or there was a group of us and he, he asked, he's like, what are some good like courses or books I can buy? And I'm like, dude, you have a great peer group. Please. I'm like, somebody like hopping on the phone with a Gary Nealon yeah. for 30 minutes yeah. will give you more like insights. value and yeah. insights, yeah. Like, contextual insights in 30 minutes than you would reading 15 books. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a really, that's, yeah. a, that's a good point to kind of hit on. Yeah. That, yeah. So um, what are some of the myths regarding... Uh, that it's a take. That's the biggest myth. That mentorship is all about a take mm. and there's no give on the other side of the equation. Mm-hmm. When, in fact, there's just as much of a give and take on the mentor's side as well, right? Like, you know, think about it. Like, there, there are... It, if, it's, if it's in the kind of thought leader world, approaching someone who kind of makes money off of their ideas, that's maybe a bigger ask. yeah. That's why I actually don't go to many people that are kind of that sell their kind of you know ideas, yeah. as opposed to going to in you know in other arenas, whether it's f- you know some sort of financial investor here in New York City, and because there's a lot of people who they 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 would they'd love to give back to someone who's hungry, especially. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, uh, so there's a total win on the mentor side as well, especially, and this is where you got to be very mindful of 
the type of person that you are and what you're bringing to the table. But if you're a desperate person looking to be saved, that is such a big ask. And I mean, it's, you know, I don't, I don't want to be so responsible for your success sure. um, that I've got to somehow save you. So if you're looking for saviors, this is not the conversation that you want to be listening to right now. Mm -hmm. But if you're someone who's hungry, you're going to do the work. I mean, that's so rewarding on the mentor side to see, like, man, someone's applying my stuff. And, 100%, yeah. Jeez, oh, they're actually getting some results. Really cool, because this stuff was just theory in my head yeah, before. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, uh, or it worked for me. Now it's working for someone else. Imagine that. Um, so, you know, hunger and showing that hunger is, um, is, is a big part of the equation for a, for a win for the mentor. Uh, I I actually smile. Uh, I shouldn't be. I've never pulled out my phone in an interview. Uh, but did you see the post that James Perley made? No. Uh, oddly enough, we're bringing up James again. <clears throat> it was hilarious. He posted it to Facebook yesterday. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up. It'll be like three seconds. Um, he said, I learned from the mistakes of other people who have followed my advice. <laughs> <I'm so laughs> <enjoying it>. um, <laughs> That's gold. But uh, That's I remember. Um, and that's one of the things I love. So uh, one of the things I love, again, what, what Jim Rohn did was he made you do three things. Yeah. And that loses so many people. Yeah. Um, like, he, well, he said that to me. He's like, you're the first person to ever call me back. Like, he's like, other people have called me back, but like months later. Yeah. And, I'm, and, and he gave me three simple, like they're pretty simple, basic, you know, tasks. Um, and, but I was the first person to call him back. Like that, so that showed hunger. That showed a willingness to be coached. That showed someone who was invested in their own success. Then as well, yeah. Um, not just you know, proclamating something and oh, I'm going to go do this and oh, we'll see. Sure, right? It's, yeah, it's the classic we'll see. Hundred percent. Like it's, it's for me. Like the people that. Uh, well, one of the things I just preach to people is like you need to be somebody worth investing in, mm -hmm. um, and you need to take action. Like you don't have to take every thing, piece of information as like gospel and you have to do everything, but you have to, you know, apply it and, and see how it works for you and, and those kind of things. Cause nothing is worse than like, yeah. and I got to do a better job myself as like when people reach out to me to, to, for mentoring is, is creating a, a couple kind of, um, hoops that they have to jump through because yeah. you lose so much. Even like when people ask me for introduction, this is a great example. Yeah. When people ask me to introduce them to people, I used to all, like blindly do it. Like I would do a double opt-in intro and reach out to the other person first and yeah, say, yeah. you know, Todd's a great friend, blah, blah, blah. Would you be open yeah. to the introduction? And they'd almost always say yes. Um, but then the one thing I realized is I started asking the question, what's your desired outcome for the introduction? And then I'll make the introduction. Yeah. I'd lose 90% of the people because they didn't have like a clear ask yeah. or, or those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. And in the context of, of mentorship, again, like not a lot of people are willing to do the work. Mm -hmm. And if you, you put a few hoops that they have to jump through kind of early on, like for me, I get energized and excited supporting somebody who applies things and, yeah. and has success and I can yeah. live kind of vicariously through them. Oddly enough, um, the people I've had the biggest success with when it comes to, to mentoring are the people who are like former athletes or mm -hmm. have achieved some level of greatness mm -hmm. in a different field. Mm -hmm. Um, because they'll just, they, they know like how to overcome, you know, just that, that rut that we run into and, and all those kind of things. Yeah. Have you seen any commonalities like, like that? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, some of it's my own personal story. I mean, people know that I've got my sports business. And so I, sure. on the business side for people who come into my kind of, um, business performance world, they have a very strong, typical, um, sports narrative. What's really funny. I was talking to uh, Tony Robbins, his team, cause he interviewed me last year, actually on the context of alter ego, mm -hmm. he had heard about it and he's like, all right, well, we got to get this guy on here to talk about this. And they kept on pinging me all last year cause it was their number one, most downloaded podcast all year long. No way, wow. Yeah. Um, uh, but he, um, I was talking, when I was talking to his team, uh, I, I stopped partway through and I said, um, cause there's two ladies. I said, did you, are both of you volleyball players? And they said, oh my goodness how did you know that? And one of them had played at, I think it was Boston college. And the other one was at like Princeton. And I was like, Oh, it's just the number one. It's not even close by far and away. The number one sport I get reached out to from after people are leaving college to like do what I did in sport are volleyball players. Really? Yeah. It's a, it's a really weird phenomenon. Huh. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I was, I kind of gave them my philosophy or my, um, summary on why that was but 
anyways, <laughs> not to, long story short, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of athletes reach out. Um, yeah. They get it. They get, they get just, you got to put in the work and the effort. I was going to say too, like around, if you are mentoring someone or when you, someone does reach out to you, don't pull out what I call the ace of spades card, which is give them the most challenging thing possible. Mm. Cause it just feeds, I mean, you're only you're like, Oh, this will disqualify them. Yeah. Like, don't be, you don't have to be that big of a dick about it. Like you can give them a five of hearts. Yeah. You know, you can give them something that's doable, but a bit of a stretch, Sure, sure. you know? Um, and that's what was great about what Jim gave me was he gave me some stretch cards, but not something that was like completely insurmountable, um, to block me out of possibly getting something from him. So where does one, um, so again, one thing I love about this PDF and we'll, we'll share the link for this yeah. PDF. Is it still out there? Yeah. 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 It's on my homepage. Uh, at Todd Herman dot me. Yeah. Dude, you, yeah, you got to pump that a little more because it is, uh, <laughs> it's gold. Um, so one thing you talk about uh, is the, like, where where does one start? Which is, mm-hmm. like, the biggest question everybody kind of um, asks me. And you actually have this little great graph with, like, um, that's, like, shaped like a T or what have you. Yeah. Um, well, let me see it because I that, I wrote that such a long time. I know, dude. Because you dump so many things some, into it. That, some yeah. people talk to me about mastermind dinners. I'm like, dude, I don't remember anything I said <laughs> in that book. Um, as soon as I wrote it, wrote it down, I forgot about everything. Yeah. Where is it? It's in here. This one. Yeah. Uh, there's, well, yeah, there's the that, enough. yeah, there's, yeah, the preparation checklist, um, the but match. Yeah, there's lots of places to start, even if we don't find it. Yeah. It's, it's in my head anyway, but yeah. Mentoring who needs it. Everybody needs it. This was a great chart too. Um, well, mentoring and coaching. And, this one directive. Yeah. Do I feel like a lawyer? I have so many papers on the table <laughs> and this was my favorite quote out of all your quotes. Yeah. Ziggs. Zig yeah. Ziglar, a lot of people have gone further than they thought they could because someone else thought they could. Yeah. The importance of belief. I mean, the amount yeah. of times, again, that somebody believed in me when I didn't necessarily believe in myself. Ugh, what a champion. Profound. Actually, you know what's funny about Zig is there's a lot of people who dismiss. So Zig Ziglar, if you don't know, I mean, one of the another great motivational guys and sales trainers from the 19... I was going to say, it's really, really weird to say 1900s. <laughs> but, um, but some people, this is the whole baby bathwater thing. Yeah. Um, is because Zig has so much religious context in his stuff, they completely throw away everything that he says. And while I'm not a super religious person by any stretch of the imagination, I just have great reverence for his thinking power and, and the great things that he does say. But this is my point is don't go to a mentor for everything. Jim taught me this really early on and he, cause he, it, we were about a year and a half into our relationship and he, and he stopped me one day and he's like, Todd, stop putting me on a pedestal. This is a really uncomfortable position for me. I don't, I don't like it up here because mm. I'm, what's going to happen is one day you're going to find out a bit of information about me or I'm going to say something that's going to make you upset and now you're not going to like me anymore maybe. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to dismiss and throw away every single piece of advice that I gave you and then you're going to wonder if I just sent you down you know, a series of roads and that's why your success got extended even longer because you were listening to some dope. Mm. You, know, you, you can't do that. I'm good at a few things. Listen to those few things, yeah. you know, because what he was referring to is, you know, he's been divorced, you know, if yeah. a couple, so if you don't, if you found that out later and he's talking to you about relationships and you're like, but the guy got divorced, yeah. you know, Hey, there's a lot of people who, you know, have gotten divorced. They can still give you great relationship conversation. Like maybe it's the what not to do sure, sometimes, sure. but it doesn't mean that all the relationships suck. Yeah. They just happen to really not That's be such successful a, with that. This was actually, I, I reached a little bit of a, a lull, um, when it came to the thirst of being a, a, a mentee mm-hmm. where my initial, my initial goals and you talk about goals and we'll talk about that in a second, like having clarity around like what you want to achieve so that yeah. you can find a mentor to kind of support you in that. Um, but my goals initially were all about um, making money. So I had mentors yeah. who helped me in that department tremendously, but didn't have like the personal life I aspired to all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I realized I was on the wrong path. I chose the wrong goals. I had a hard time finding the next mentor because I was trying to find a mentor who was a full package Mm -hmm. and I could not find that said mentor. And it took me honestly like two years to realize why don't I just start focusing on certain areas. So like have a mentor when it comes to relationships or have a mentor when it comes to parenting. Parenting, yeah, Yeah. 100%. Loop back on the the benefits because you you put it in here and I thought they were – I thought they were great. So the benefits to the mentor because this is something – again, the the mentor benefits aren't often Mm -hmm. um, talked about. So the – 
satisfaction of seeing someone else grow, an opportunity to be challenged, uh, an opportunity to lead and inspire someone who's ambitious, um, opportunity to take time out and reflect. Because yeah. oftentimes, I, you know, we, we don't like to be able to um, to be able to like teach somebody and, and you really have to sit with yeah. a lot of like your philosophies and stuff like that and, yeah. and you get significantly kind of more kind of clarity yeah. um, and it's just hugely uh, beneficial um, and which actually ties to improves and refreshes a mentor's skills and experiences gives new insights into mentor's own working relationships um, so there's a ton of benefits uh, to, to, to being a mentor well and the one, one thing that I learned as well is the um the massive reward of being around what I think are shooting stars. Mm. So yeah, hundred percent. Like there, if if someone ends up reaching out to you for mentorship, and again, like I said at the beginning, don't go out that way with that big ask. Just start building a relationship with someone, yeah. and if it evolves into something great, then yeah. great. But yeah. don't ask for the mentor thing. That's just that shouldn't be the first email. Yeah, I really would like you as a mentor. No, just the minute you throw a label on it, it yeah. just kill it dies. It, it kills it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when you meet someone, or when you've got someone that you're quote unquote mentoring, and they're they're a shooting star, they're going to take you to places as well that you didn't know sure. that you were going to be going to. It's that um, people say, "Oh well." Uh, even in business, like when you find someone who you know they're going to start their own business one day anyway, they're not going to be in your business that long, so why would I? I'm like, the impact that that person can make in six months in your business, Yeah. plus, don't forget, they're going to be going on and starting their own business, and yep. you have no idea if they're going to loop back around and bring you along on this, or, you know, or they'll never forget the person that took a chance on them when other people kept on saying, no, you're, gonna, you're too entrepreneurial, and, and they go, you know what, I never forgot that Jason was and now that they're running Tesla they bring you in to talk to you. like yeah it happens all the time you can't yeah you, I mean I've definitely learned like you can't connect the dots looking forward the yeah. whole like Steve Jobs saying and for me like one of my beliefs or philosophies around relationships is amazing people become increasingly amazing over time mm-hmm. so if you can invest in people the one of the reasons for for the podcast is is um just mentorship at scale it gives me the ability to yeah uh, take a lot of what i learn and just put it out there and instead of doing it one-on-one which i still do from time to time yeah may, enables me to have ten thousand people i'm mentoring or yeah or, or they're getting lessons from people like you and that kind of stuff but it's even funny the whole thing with with james who was my first mentor you know six years later he's paying to come to mastermind talks and then i opened him up to a whole new yeah. community of people that he didn't kind of have uh wouldn't have had access to otherwise and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. the one question I – actually, I'll, I'll keep that for a little later. But um, the reason I want to highlight the benefits to a mentor is oftentimes people are, uh, again, go into it thinking it's, it's very much a taking scenario yeah. and that keeps them from asking uh, yeah. in, in the first place. Um, well, you Think about it from the context of big brothers, big sisters, right? Who's the one who ends up getting the most out of it? Mm, sure. It's the big brother and the big sister a lot of times. I mean, they mm. both get a ton out of it. Not that we're supposed to compare between the two, but anyone who's done it, I've done it. I've done big brothers, big sisters. And I mean, the, the rewards that you get out of that relationship, and it translates perfectly into mentorship as well, if you, if you go in with the right attitude with it. Yeah. yeah. So what are some, some ways um, that one, so if, if somebody knows that they, they, they need a mentor, they need some kind of guidance. Yeah. So step one would be kind of clarity on mm-hmm. kind of where you are, where you want to go yeah. on some level. And then step two would be to identify who has achieved that level of success, yeah. I take it. Uh, so I think it's, you know, first find the subject matter that you want mentorship with. Like what's that topic area of your life that you would like some mentorship with? Mm-hmm. And then uh, this is the one thing I think most human beings have a block with, and that is they're too private with their ambitions, yeah. Most it's impossible for your entire friend network to know how to help you if they don't know what you're working on right now. And so, you know, once you know what that subject matter is, whether it's like entrepreneurship and starting a business or it's marketing or it's parenting, um, the great thing is, is now based before, like as opposed to when you and I first started out in business, there's this thing called social networks where it's really easy to spread a message out to your crowd and let them know, hey, you know, I've been really reflecting a lot on like, you know, my life and my goals that I have and, you know, something that's missing is having some great leadership in in this one area. So I'd love if any of you had any ideas of people that I could connect with 
on the subject of entrepreneurship or business or running a business or marketing or something um, and just see what names get thrown out and see you, you just don't know mm. who has a connection into somebody. Yeah. So it's A, it's definitely find out what's that subject matter that you're, that you're trying to be better at and then let people know um, about it. And so again, the quality of your network is going to define the quality of the results that you get from that. So mm -hmm. if you've invested a big chunk of your life not really investing in a great group of people around you, then the quality of those answers you're going to get isn't going to be that great. But there's still probably one eagle in that crowd mm -hmm. who might see that post or that email that you might send out or that text message or something um, and could help you. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can also go to the book aisle. So one of my mentors, even though I just got done saying before about like, don't go out asking for mentorship right off the bat, I'm also going to contradict myself because one of my greatest mentors is that's exactly how I got him. So Harvey Dorfman, who wrote the book, Coaching the Mental Game is known as the Yoda of mental toughness, um, passed away in um, a few years ago as well. But I reached out to him when I first started getting into the mental game world because I came across his book and I was like, okay, here's someone who's not using a bunch of cycle babble crap that athletes are not going to use, you know, um, propagated by some psychologist who's never actually played the sport or done work with any athletes, but just has some ideas. And here's someone who's just talking so matter of factly, swore like a truck driver, which I liked, you know, being a farm kid. And uh, so I reached out to him and just said, you know, hi, Harvey, it's Todd Herman. We've never had the pleasure of meeting before, but, you know, I've read coaching the mental game over and over and over again. I'm just getting started out in this field. And I would love if you would um, allow me to come down and um, work for you for free on administrative stuff. Just, I'm sure you're really busy and you'd love to write another book because he had already had a couple of books, but you're just caught up in doing the, you know, because it's just, it's just the reality of business. Sure, You're caught up in, you know, taking care of that stuff and I'd love to take it off your off your plate. Mm. That was my ask, was actually me going out, and I didn't say, my, my internal ask was, this guy's gonna mentor me, but <laughs> I'm going to, I'm gonna work for him for free. Yeah. And you know, so he called me back, and he was like, all right, you know, what's the angle here, kid? And I said, well, it's obvious, like, I'm gonna learn from osmosis just being around you, yeah. but you know, I do know that you probably have some things that you wanna work on, and you know, I, I get it, like, as, when you're running a, a sole proprietorship business, you're probably caught up doing a lot of things, so I'd love to take him off your plate. And it was January, because it was the off-season for baseball. That's where he was kind of known as baseball. And uh, went back and forth a little bit, and he's like, all right. He's like, but you're not staying with me, right? That's his, that's his other question. He's like, you're not staying with me, right? You don't think you're gonna stay with me? And I said, no, I'm not. I've got an aunt and uncle who live in North, he was in North Carolina at the time. I remember the story. Yeah, you're, I've got an aunt and uncle that live in the area, and I'm gonna stay with them. He's like, oh, okay. Well, I didn't have an aunt and uncle that lived down there. And there was a Motel 6 that was about 15 minutes away from his place. And I stayed in a Motel 6 for 29 bucks a night. And How uh, old were you back then? Oh, this was 20, 23 ish, mm. something like that, 23, mm. 24. And so, yeah, I went down there. And I spent 32, 33 days with him. And uh, my seventh day wow. there, Roger Clemens came down for his annual pilgrimage to spend a day with Harvey because like, he was just the Yoda. Like, yeah. everyone came down. Andy Pettit, Craig Biggio. Like, like half day after day and he let me sit in there and watch and so here I am sitting with the best of the best seeing how he works with the best of the best in sport well I couldn't have read a book that could show me how to actually have a conversation or hear the challenges that those pro athletes are truly dealing with mm -hmm. right I would have made I had so many assumptions that they would be challenged with like 89% of them had nothing to do with the sport itself it had to do with like the administrative part of life almost Mm -hmm. um, and just rapid acceleration. And then he ended up funneling me a lot of clients and, and customers. And so that's what blew up my business was, yeah. was that. So, yeah. yeah. I remember you sharing that story a while, a while ago. Yeah. I was trying to piece together which mentor yeah, that was, because obviously was you've, you've had many. He's phenomenal. Phenomenal, man. Yeah. And, and one, I guess one of the myths that you actually talk about in the, the PDF, uh, was it's for amateurs or for those who are just starting out. Mm. Um, is there so how do, do do mentors still play a role in your life and what does that oh yeah that, that actually look like? Tucker Max and I were just talking about this uh, maybe a year ago okay. and we were talking about mentors he's like I know you're super big on mentors he's like I've never had a mentor and he's like I think I'm a little bit too long in the tooth to get a mentor now and I was like dude you're you're never too old mm. like there's so many areas of your life where you're still an amateur 
right? Like it, you, you can't have mastered everything. Definitely writing. You're, you're like, you're, yeah. you're my mentor. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. Tucker's my mentor. Sure. And uh, on that. Uh, but yeah, no, you're never too old. So just that attitude. It's, you know, it's ego or it's just the wrong definition of maybe how life works that we get to a certain point. And you can't teach old dogs new tricks and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I have consistently seen it where the people who operate at the highest levels are like, it's just a constant mission of who's my, like where my next, where's my next mentor going to come from? Mm. It's this insatiable appetite for just wanting to be around the best and, um, you know, really crafting their own future because of getting this osmosis from, from other people. So it's not just for that college kid who gets out and gets done playing volleyball at Penn state and reaches out to Todd to, you know, how can I build a sports psych practice or mental game practice? No, it's for all, all levels Mm. for sure. So looking at kind of where you are, where you want to go, like what you want to to learn specifically, um, and then putting it out to your network. If you you have an existing network that may connect up some dots for, for you or I mean, we, again, we live in a beautiful time where you can reach out to almost anybody and find any, almost anybody's email address and and those kind of things. And if you make a compelling enough offer, you'll, you'll, you'll be the signal and the noise. Like that's the one thing, even with like, uh, Shep, how I reached out to mm-hmm. to Shep. I mean, he gets I, 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 until I managed his Facebook account at one point in time, and he's not a big celebrity. But like, I realized like how many messages these people get, and how easy it is yeah. to just get lost in all of yeah. that, and um, kind of going above and beyond in my outreach. And then literally, when I hopped on the phone with him, I said, "Listen, like I know, you know." email and all that kind of stuff probably isn't like, knowing he's an older guy that's yeah. probably not the best method of communication i'll fly to hawaii um just for like a 15 minute conversation if we hit it off great if we don't there's yeah. no pressure expectations i'll hop right back like i'm not yeah i'm not making a vacation out of this and that kind of stood out um did and, you have any like doubt as to whether or not you're going to be able to pull off the 15 minute conversation um, I was nervous as hell standing outside his house. Like I was yeah. nervous the entire flight and all that kind of stuff. But being being outside his house, I'm like, oh my god. Um, it's just it was I was incredibly nervous. But we we really really hit it off. And I was nervous more about like because I was the reason I reached out to him similar to to, yeah. to what you did. Like I was very clear upfront of like what I'm looking to get out of this or yeah. not. Like I told him I was a big fan. I I, I stumbled across the documentary. Um, through mutual friends, oh, sorry, through, sorry, through friends of mine that told me to to check it out. Um, I've never felt the the desire. Like honestly, watching that documentary, I'm like, this guy's like my long lost father. Like mm-hmm. what people were saying about him in his 70s, I'm like, I want people to say that about me. Yeah. Um, and I've never felt that connection with anybody. Like I don't yeah. want to connect with big names for ego purposes or yeah. those kind of things. But I'm ne- I was like, if I could meet this guy one day, like that would be yeah. that'd be great. Then I found out he was coming out with a book. And Zig Ziglar, looping back to, to Zig, he has a saying that you go from survival, sustainability, sustainability to, to success, and then success to significance. Mm-hmm. And the one thing I realize is a lot of people who are very successful at what they do, oftentimes the, that next level for them is that significance piece. Yeah. So whether that be writing a book or speaking to colleges or those kind of things, if you can help them with that next phase, um, it's of high value to them. And... Uh, so I found out he was coming out with a book. I ended up emailing him a few times and always got blocked by his lovely assistant, Nancy, who's fantastic, but she's great at the job she does, which is blocking um, people and ended up finding his email address and I emailed him and CC'd her to be like, shoot, I, I told you I'd get through that thing. And he ended up replying back and said, uh, we went back and forth. I said, listen, I know you're coming out with a book. Um, and uh, That's in my wheelhouse. It, yeah, and I, I said, yeah. listen, like, I, I have a lot of friends who've, and I was very clear of, like, my skills and expertise as well. I said, listen, like, I, I've written a book, like, and it, it did well on Amazon, but yeah. I have a lot of friends who've had New York Times bestselling books, and I'm assuming your, your intention putting out this book to the world is to hit New York Times or, you know, for, for it, for the message to get out there. And I, I said, listen, I'm a huge fan of your message, and if I can get it out there, I know book marketing requires a lot of heavy lifting. And I said, I'll be transparent with you out front, up front. This is really odd outreach for me. Because I don't want anything from you. like, the, And that's kind of, yeah. I wish I did want something from yeah. you so it could be clear. Um, but I don't. I'm just a huge fan of you and a huge fan of the message. And that kind of stood out, I guess. And then we hopped on a call. I flew to Maui. Yeah. I, I, he was kind enough to extend his home to me uh, during that stay. And um, 
yeah, we're there for for a couple of days. We really hit it off, and that's that's how kind of it uh, it happened. But to one actually to one point that you talked about, um, and you know, Shep is still a very good friend and all those kind of things. But one of the myths that you talked about is that it's a long term relationship that like it's a forever thing. Mm-hmm. And once I supported him with a book, and he came to MMT, and he's like all that kind of stuff. I was like, I, dude, there's there's not a lot of commonalities kind of that hold us together. That was kind of a little bit hard to like yeah. hard of a hard pill to swallow on some level. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we still communicate by email, but it's not as as frequent and uh, yeah. it, not as much as before. So it's kind of it's good to also realize like these, these it's like mentorship is not this like 10, 15 year relationship. Yeah. It can be a couple of emails, could be a couple months. It, it, yeah. Like understanding it's nothing necessarily long term, and it's super flexible. Yeah. To like it, again, it's not sitting down once a month. It can be. Yeah. But um, really, you and your mentor can kind of design that structure. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, and it just. I don't know. I think people should be very mindful of the spirit that they're in when they send the message because it just, I I don't know what happens, but it permeates through the words. But um, like if you're feeling desperate, it'll, it'll, you know, your choice choice of words will come across. Yeah. But because I see it, I mean, I get pinged a lot, um, especially by a lot of young athletes. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, because of the platform with business stuff online. um, And there's a young guy from, uh, Germany who just reached out to me just before Christmas time, a couple weeks before Christmas. And there's just something about the way that he did it. His ask was pretty much the same as everyone else's ask almost, Mm -hmm. but there's just something about it. That's what caused me to kind of reach back out and, you know, I'm helping him out with a couple of things, but, uh, yeah, there's just, you kind of, you almost get a sense of someone's intention and that they truly do believe what they're saying is true for them, that they feel like they're, that there's something big that they're about to do. They just can't seem to, they just need some help. Yeah. And, you know, I'll help. Yeah. I mean, putting effort into that first impression is, is crucial. Yeah. A lot of people are just very sloppy with it. And to what you said, it's so weird that you can, just the placement of words, all the yeah. same words, but just how they're sequenced and all that kind of stuff gives off a completely different vibe. Yeah. Um, and you know one the, one of the things that I always kind of look to is there's a saying from Twenty Two Immutable Laws of Marketing, which is what works in the military works in marketing, and that's the unexpected. Mm-hmm. So I think of like somebody like a, let's say a Shep who gets yeah you know a couple hundred Facebook messages messages a day uh, or a couple hundred emails a day. Um, how can I make my email stand out yeah. in that sea of emails? So maybe it's a video email, or yeah. maybe it's sending something traditionally like direct mail or handwritten yeah. note, like what you've done and and those kind of things. Or my friend, um, uh, just a new friend, really Stu Heineke. Um, who wrote a great book called How to Get a Meeting with Anyone. His, so he's a cartoonist for The New Yorker. Um, if you ever want a connection with Stu, uh, I'll hook you up. So um, amazing book, but it's all about, you know, when you're, when you're trying to get to the top level people, an email just doesn't cut it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so f- for me, like when I was breaking out into the, the sports world, like I said, what? I don't even know if you, I told you this story. My my first direct mail piece that I sent out was I went to Canadian Tire, which is like for those Americans and other people out there, it's like the Walmart of Canada. And I went to Canadian Tire and I bought 16 hockey pucks, went home and I had a, bought a hacksaw and I cut every single hockey puck in half and um, had cement glue. And I wrote a letter and uh, left room in the upper right hand area and on the upper left is a picture of me and my headline said just like you can't play hockey with half a hockey puck you can't develop an NHL caliber athlete by only focusing on their skills and um, like s- something like that yeah. their physical self and then it got into like you know just developing mental game stuff or whatever and I mean I was so green behind the ears when I sent this um, making a lot of assumptions but and I stuck half the hockey puck on the page. And then I mailed it. So lumpy mail. And I mailed it off to all of the 16 Western Conference teams because I, I lived in Western Canada at the time. And I couldn't mail them to the Eastern Conference teams because when I looked at how much the cost of travel was, <laughs> I wasn't going to have enough money if someone said yes. <laughs> so I was like, well, I could drive to pretty much, you know, I could fly down to LA and that was not an expensive flight. And so I mailed them all off and I had, so I had 32 total half hockey bucks, mailed them to the coach and the GM of every single team. Mm. And then I waited and I FedExed them, lumpy mail. That thing, that cost me $1,118 and 56 cents. Never forget that amount. Um, mailed them off and then I waited a few days 
And then I started calling West Coast over. And I started calling, and I called um, the um, Vancouver Canucks. And Dave Nonis was the GM there at the time. And I called in and I said, uh, hi, is Dave in, please? Thinking that it was, and she was like, yeah, uh, can I let him know calling? I'm like, holy shit, I'm not <laughs> to talk to the GM this quickly. And uh, I was like, yeah, can you just let him know that it's Todd Herman? She's like, hey, you're the half hockey puck guy. And I was like, sure. yes, I am. And I could hear her yelling, hey, Dave, do you want to talk to the hockey puck guy? And, she, and he's like, yeah, send him through. And there's a whole bunch of people in his office. So he put me on speakerphone. And there's like four other coaches that were in the room. He's like, the half hockey puck guy, that's one of the best pieces of mail I've ever gotten. That's hilarious. Da, da, da. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, well, I wasn't really trying to be super funny. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But whatever. And um, yeah, so we ended up chatting for like 90 minutes. And then they already had someone that they were working with, Saul Miller, who's like, you know, the Yoda of hockey, mm -hmm. very famous um, mental game guy, amazing man. And uh, but they said, you know, just like anybody, like not everyone likes working with Saul. So I'm going to put you in contact with a few agents who I know that their players don't work with Saul really. Um, and that's how it all started. I had three major agents that I worked with, and they funneled a lot of clients my way too. Did you do this with a fish? I did it with a fish too. Yeah, so that was when I wanted to get a, a gig at Intuit because um, Intuit's head office was in Edmonton. That's where I lived at the time. Yeah. And um, this one role was like a really great opportunity for me to kind of sharpen some business skills. So, but they wanted someone with like a college degree. We actually wanted an MBA and I was nowhere near even the college degree part. Mm -hmm. I had one year, played college football and then left. Um, and so... I went to the toy store, bought a plush fish toy, like a stuffed fish toy yeah. for a kid, and um, stuck a note to it, like stabbed a note to it, and it said, um, I'm like a fish out of water waiting for the opportunity for this upcoming role. I know I'm perfect for it. Um, and then I had my CV in behind it, sent it, uh, took it in. Um, at the time, I knew, because I actually went out and, and um, surveilled into it for three days straight to see when the CEO would show up. Mm. So I went in and I dropped it off a couple minutes before he would arrive. So he would see it on the front desk area. Mm. And so he picked it up, saw it. Bruce went and took it straight to the head of HR and said, these are the types of people we need in this um, organization. And that's how I got the gig. Dude, you make me feel like a chump. I, I, <laughs> oh, I, no, here I am doing video emails or something <laughs> like that. You're sending these, these, these fishes and you're, you're thinking yeah. outside the box, man. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Um, well, I got, I got um, a friend's son, you know, the, uh, the job of a lifetime here in New York City doing that exact same thing, mm -hmm. sending a CEO of a company, major company here in New York City who's Canadian, uh, from Quebec, I, I said, send him some maple syrup. Make sure it's Canadian maple syrup, though. <laughs> None of this U.S. stuff. No, and Jemima? Ma yeah, <laughs> sent him some Canadian maple syrup and said, because um, he had had his uh, resume into the company for a while and wasn't getting any traction, um, and said, uh, you know, something like, you know, here's a little taste of home. Mm. Um, and... That was kind of basically, he had something else to elaborate on, the fact that he had a resume in there, but oh, here's a taste of home. Yeah. Um, da, 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 and that was, and then he got a job. It's, uh, you know, the funny thing is, is that like, I, th I think it's also important to note, like the puck thing. I know when you, you were talking about, you're like, it was some of it, like, mm -hmm. would you do it again? Like maybe not, like it was a little, I don't say amateurish, but it was. Oh, it was totally kitschy. But oh, the yeah. thing is, is like, it's, you, you receive something like that. It's like endearing. Yeah. It catches their, and then it reminds me of like when I was, uh, and it, comes full circle with the outreach for a mentor is I remember my first ever business. I was 12 years old. It was a lawn cutting and social shoveling business um, back home. And I remember uh, sending out all these flyers of like, you know, I was going to cut lawns, all this kind of stuff. And um, it was probably, I, I sent probably 450 of these things out. Um, was 450 of these things out and basically uh, I got no response. Yeah. The last 50, I'm like, I'm just going to write a personal note at the bottom yeah. saying like, hey, I'm a 13-year-old boy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, just want to support, whatever, yeah. do stuff in the community. Um, out of those 50 that I, I did, I got like, I think it was like 12 clients yeah. from. So just like showcasing the importance of like vulnerability and yeah. and just being you. Yeah. Um, not trying to portray something you're not. Just like how I re reached out to Shep and I didn't say I'm some master mar book marketer, but I'll yeah. definitely try my best. Yeah. You know, in, in that, like when I, when I, my first sales job, I was working with Xerox doing door to door sales, you know, in New York City doing business stuff. And I was terrible, Jason. I was so bad. And, but then after a while, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go in and, and I walked in, 
I didn't really plan it. And I just walked in. And was, she seemed like it was a nice. She was a nice lady. She didn't, not that she said anything to me, but I, I walked up and I said, um, uh, "Listen, I'm not really very good at this, but I need to sell to somebody. Mm-hmm. I'm just a farm kid from Southern Alberta." And as soon as I said the farm kid thing, she's like, "Oh my god, my aunt, my my grandparents they had a farm." And so I just kept on using that whole "I'm a farm kid." Yeah. And that opened up all these doors because yeah. I was all some relatable. I wasn't, you know, it humanized this guy who was there to sell, you know, printers and copiers or whatever. So now, does, does that work for you when you're experienced? Not necessarily, no. Sure. But to your point about the whole uh, hockey puck thing is amateurish. Yeah. Yeah, but it's also endearing, yeah. you know, off that. Like if someone had sent it that was, you know, very experienced, they might have done it in a better way too. Yeah, but yeah. 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 So yeah. So we talked about basically finding a mentor, what that looks like. The, the I guess the structure of the relationship is is variable. There's 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 no mm-hmm. kind of rule. What is one of the uh, and also that it's it's not a, a, like a, it doesn't have to be an ongoing yeah. relationship. When it does come to a close, yeah. Um, what is one of the best ways to honor that that relationship? Is there something in particular to, that you could do to? honor it or anything come to mind? Yeah, I think the best way um, of honoring that relationship is to continuously talk about its importance in your life. Mm. Like that's how I think I do it with Harvey yeah. and Jim and Grant and other people that have you know been there for me. I think that's one of the great ways. I mean, you could you could probably send gifts. You're, you're probably, well, John's better at both of us than at sure. sending gifts, that's right? That's his jam. Um, that's his jam. So, um, there's, I haven't really thought it through necessarily of like how you honor it a, a ton going forward, but I think constantly actually finding more, that the, the one thing I did do consistently is always finding other ways of supporting that person going forward too. Mm-hmm. So like Harvey, um, there was a lot of times where I got contacted about media stuff where I wasn't the right person because they were actually looking for someone who did have more experience and I'd be like, that's the guy, you got to go get Harvey and Harvey and Harvey and and that stuff was never lost on him at all. Mm. And I'm like, well, of course I need to do this for you. Cause you've been, you took a bet on me kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so any chance you can get to put those other people's up, up on a platform for themselves, I think is a great way of honoring it too. Well, Todd Herman, you're a beautiful man, a mentor <laughs> of mine. And, uh, yeah, dude, just a huge fan of yours. So not a couple of things. Obviously you have the book coming out yeah. sometime 2018, 2019, 90 day year is mm-hmm. something we didn't, a chat about obviously because you were kind enough to yeah, yeah. To, to focus on yeah. the topic of mentorship yeah. but I've had I've gone through 90 year 90 day year program mm-hmm. I've had a lot of mutual well, we have mutual friends that have gone through the program it's been hugely uh, impactful is that something that's available all year round or is it only yeah so in the past we've always just made it available um, uh, as a program uh, a couple times a year but now we're going to be rolling it out um, basically available pretty much most of the year now um, starting well by the time this gets out to people, it'll probably be already available. Yeah. So, um, uh, and it's my high performance system for, um, uh, it started in sports, worked into corporate. And now it's the one that's online right now is specifically for entrepreneurs and business owners to plug in a system to help them stay really focused to get things done and achieved in a, in a, in a fast time frame. And that's 90 day year.com. Yeah. And Todd Herman dot me. You got it. For the, mentorship pdf that i keep referring to there's yeah. there's so much gold in here <laughs> um and then we'll also put it in the community made group as well so you have access to it in there but uh that's it dude anything Love you, for you man thank you anything for you oh, Cheers. beautiful time thanks man you back So that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening. As a quick reminder, Todd wrote a fantastic mini book called How to Find and Become a Mentor, which served as a foundation for the structure of my last episode, The Wisest Investment is Wisdom. It's a fantastic read. I highly recommend you check it out. To get access to Todd's free guide, visit toddherman.me slash blog, or just go to toddherman.me and click on the blog. You'll see an opportunity there to leave your email address and you'll get the PDF version. Again, 
I can't say enough about it. I told him, I think I may mention of it in this episode, how bloody good it is. Second, in the last episode, I shared a high level overview of a mentoring session worksheet that has worked really well for me over the years. Uh, so to get access to that, to kind of support you in your mentor mentee sessions, or even if you're at a mastermind of sorts, the actual PDF can be found in the resource section of the community made group. If you're not a member, lucky for you, joining is free. Simply go to communitymade.com to get access. Access. The third and final thing, I decided to take some of the concepts of this season on how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships and go deeper in a intimate workshop setting because I love facilitating workshops. I love face-to-face -face type environments and experiences. And we announced the first workshop sold out before we launched season two. So we announced a second workshop date. So for dates and availability on that, visit superconnectorworkshop.com. That's superconnector.com workshop.com if you enjoyed this episode show some love to todd by taking a screenshot of your podcast app and pinging him on instagram at todd t-o-d-d -D, underscore herman h-e-r-m-a-n for more details on todd again visit toddherman.me or 90dayyear.com before i go i gotta give a shout out to christy birch for leaving the following review on itunes she said being an event producer myself, I've been a fan of Jason's ever since I heard about MMT. His heart for creating true connection at his events and the excellence in which he executes is inspiring to me. I was naturally excited to dive into this podcast when it launched and it is not disappointed. Right off the bat, I resonated with episode two, Scaling is Stupid, because I've secretly felt the same way but been shy to express it in this go big or go home culture of entrepreneurship, which is so prevalent. The production quality is top notch, which makes it fun to listen to, and Jason is so well connected. I know he'll always have high caliber guests with interesting subject matter. Thank you, Jason, for all the work that you're doing to educate and inspire. No, thank you, Christy, for the review. I really appreciate it. We have a handful of mutual friends, so I'm looking forward to crossing paths in the near future. For the rest of you out there, if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast and like what we're doing here at Community Made, I would be forever grateful if you would share this podcast with your friends or leave an honest review on iTunes or Facebook, just like Christy did. That stuff goes a long way. I really appreciate it. Join me for the next episode where I'll be tackling one of the most frequently asked questions that I get, which is how to manage your relationships or how to manage your network. So I'll be sharing the five categories of relationships and the practical steps you can take to nurture them each step of the way, why the key to a strong network is subtraction and not addition, and how to constantly be reinvesting in existing relationships and micro-investing in new ones. I'll see you on the next episode. Enjoy your week.